Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you before we get started i have a quick favor i've been self-funding the finding genius podcast for five years now i've done over three thousand episodes and as you can see on youtube we're up over a million views on the channel which is fantastic the next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going. And I love coffee. Thank you. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Dr. Patrick Flynn. He's, the author, he's an author, and he's the founder of Wellness Way Clinics. The book he authored is called I Disagree, how these two words are the secret to thinking differently and taking control of your health. So, Patrick, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be on today. Tell me a bit about your, your history. How did you get to the point that you're at today? Well, there's two major ventures that happened that led to what I'm, you know, uh, still doing this wonderful time that we're in is uh, I had some health issues as a, as a young child that um, basically the medical field, you know, they tried very hard to, you know, they, they always do doctors trying to make people the best they possibly can. And of course, obviously it didn't work. So then as I was a teenager, I started to realize that uh, the path I was on wasn't going to be a good one unless I started to take things in my own hands. And so I started to investigate what health was at a young age. And it led to what I'm doing today. And nice thing is, you know, I suffered from a lot of psychiatric things where, you know, your brain's going 100 miles an hour. They probably would have diagnosed me more of an autism spectrum back then if it, it was today. But then what happened is I figured out some things that were key to my own health. And I ended up going to college. 
you know, focusing on the health field. Uh, my two loves are nutrition and immunology. And then I realized that the medical field probably wasn't going to help me. So moving in that direction, I decided to go to chiropractic school because I wanted to move more into that natural realm. And then before I was done with school, I met this woman who once again had an issue. She actually said she couldn't have children. Okay. I started dating her. And now as of today, she's my wife and we have four beautiful daughters and how that whole stemmed up on the, on that we'll probably talk about today was I realized that the, the thinking, the process, the, the approach and everything that they were looking at for me as my health venture and, and the other one as my wife, once again, is it's, there's really a lot of different perspectives. So what I did is I started practice here in Green Bay, Wisconsin 23 years ago. So in 1999 and started out with one clinic. And now we have offices all over the United States and now branching into Europe uh, with the yeah. same concepts that we do. So yes. And then I authored a book that became an international bestseller within a, within a week, actually, because I believe by saying I disagree with the doctors from all the venues that they even say today, and it could be from fertility to autism to COVID and everything. Uh, we need doctors, especially ones that think differently, say I disagree because uh, I hate to say this. And, and um, I just got a simple statement that we can discuss a lot. When people say that the experts say this, I say, well, listen, experts say a lot of things. How are we doing? And I think over the last two years, especially with all the experts saying stuff, we're not doing well and stuff. So we need to actually yeah. come up with a different perspective. Well, it seems like uh, doctors used to be able to say, I disagree. But now when they say, I disagree, the state medical board says, oh, thanks for your license. Have a nice day. Yeah, they do. That they even, yes, I have. Actually, the point where the FBI even showed up at my house. So, Jeez. but that's okay and stuff. Because like I said, is uh, I will say they were respectful. They were this, this, this. And uh, um, it just was a great experience to show you that. It's going to show you also government should not be involved in anything in healthcare. Government should be involved in anything. But the idea is this, healthcare, especially because it becomes a bureaucracy, not about people. Yeah, when I think about traditional health care, you have doctors, and again, I, I'm being derisive, but you know, it's my experience. I call them idiopaths yeah. because they never yeah. seem to know what's going on. And then you layer on top of that insurance who doesn't care about what's going on and doesn't even have any medical training. And then, you know, how are you supposed to get any medical care if you layer those two on top of each other without, you know, you thinking and looking and trying to figure out what, what actually works for you and reporting back and, and getting help? It just seems like the medical system is a mess. Yeah, and I think that I believe I have some analogies and some understanding that would make the medical field very strong and also would make our world very strong. But they, they're trying to intertwine, and then they try to bring other things in there. But uh, I believe that what I did from my perspective is said, listen, I'm going to move in a direction that I believe is going to be very helpful for patients. And I was a poor country kid that started one office on $500, once again, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, 23 years ago to now an international company of clinics and doctors of all kinds to actually, you know, really making a big impact on people to where if you go to our website, thewellnessway.com, you realize that, we, that um, we've branched out because there are sick people everywhere that really need help and the information we're going to share today. Yeah, and talking about hormones, um, when my mm -hmm. wife and I were trying to have our first child, it took, I don't know, several years. We tried this, that, and the other, and finally we found a doctor that, that did a test and said, hey, your progesterone levels could use supplementation. So she yeah. did. We had our first child, and we were all good from there. So I could see, you know, at least somewhat the power of hormones and, you know, balancing them the right way. Yeah, well, that's one thing that uh, a perspective is great to know. Listen, you know, you can't run a car if it has no fuel, regardless of how new the car is. And that's not really a perspective that most uh, medical field looks at that way. They look at everything. And, and I think the example that really sets some understanding and will be able to go forward with this kind of thinking, you know, if we look at, I, I really say there's two forms of doctoring. Um, number one, I say this, if somebody, you know, leaves their house today and, or leaves their out work day and goes home and the house is on fire, we need to call a professional to actually see if we can save the house. And that's the fire department. They're going to come there as quickly as possible, use their axes and hoses, try to put up the fire. And guess what happens? If they get there in time and do their job well, they, they're successful and they actually allow the house to not be totally burnt down. Now, that being said, by getting there on time, doing a great job, it doesn't mean that they that the house is actually livable. It doesn't mean the house is actually great for you. Actually, if you even try to stay there that night, you could die from just the toxic fumes. So you need to call another professional, even though that the fire department did a really good professional job by saving your house. But the different professional is a carpenter. And as a carpenter looks at the house, they go, oh, man, what a mess, even though the fire department is saying, I did a wonderful job. I saved it. Okay. And the carpenter walks in the same house, even the fire department is still there, says, hey, listen, this is a mess. I need to rip up the carpet. I need to rip up the walls. And I need to rebuild this house to get it back to normal. 
Now, I tell people, that's the way we need to look at healthcare and doctoring. Most of our medical field is basically the fire department. They have axes and hoses, drugs and surgery to, to save a life. But the confusion is making them an expert to save a life doesn't mean they're an expert to rebuild the body and take care of it. And that's the one thing that when you have a person has a heart attack and they, they almost die and the doctor saves them, thank God. They use their drugs and surgeries, the axe hoses to pull up the fire. But there's things that cause the fire. And, you know, I always tell people this. And you've been under the care of that doctor the whole time that led you to your house catch on fire in the first place. So I came up saying, listen, we need carpenter-type doctors to know what the body needs, how to rebuild it, how to take care of it, things like that. And in the majority of the time, if those are used on a regular basis, your chance of having a fire is less anyways. And so I started that with uh, back in 1999 going, I'm going to show you a form of healthcare that's going to test, definitely do things, repair the body, build it, rebuild it. And then I can show you major illnesses that have reversed based, based on that process to the point that all doctors, I'm from medical to natural, started coming to me going, can you show me what you're doing? I said, sure. And then, of course, I've trained thousands of doctors. Like I said, then a bunch of them started to become wellness wake offices all over the country. And, and it doesn't matter if you're suffering from PCOS to endometriosis, infertility to GI problem. Um, if you look at it from our perspective, like I say, the carpenter perspective, your approach is dramatically different. The sad part is this. You can have an approach on everything, including COVID. And because government is involved with our form of current healthcare today, that's why there's actually basically a tyranny when it comes to the medical field. The medical field is a very tyrannical situation. It doesn't mean that there's not great doctors that are trying to do the right thing, because there is, but the control of medicine is actually tyrannical government business. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click support us today. Now, back to the show. Well, that's a really good example. I like your analogy of the uh, mm-hmm. the fire department and then the subsequent yep. people needing to clean up the house. Yep. What are a couple um, examples of cases you worked on, you know, without names or anything, and knowing that every sure. case is different? What are a good, good few cool stories that come to mind? Well, let's even just stand from simple simple part of hormones. You know, when, when my wife suffered from endometriosis, so let's take some major hormonal condition, all right? And we're going to even use the, the, the aspect of your wife of progesterone. But if you look at the, a guy, but let's start with a guy because it'll be a little better to understand. If I were to ask you, you know, what is the major male hormone that makes us who we are, what would you tell me? Oh, testosterone is the major one, yeah, right? And for exactly. women, estrogen. Now we, yeah, we, 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 have it, we have it all. We have it all. We all know this. Testosterone is the dominant. We all have the same hormones, but our dominant high level hormones is testosterone. Now, I already said it, but I want to re-ask this so the audience hears it. But the women have all the hormones, but they have a major, major dominant one. And what, which one is it? Estrogen. What if I told you that you've been lied to and estrogen is not a hormone? No. Oh. Well, I know there's estriol, estradiol, et cetera. But uh, and tell me what you mean by your question or your, your answer. Well, you actually kind of start to equate to it, but most people do not know that. Estrogen is a general term that describes many hormones. Now, here's what I'm thing. Estrogen is the major hormones that make a woman a woman. Progesterone can maintain certain tissues, but it doesn't develop a woman physically and psychologically. Okay. It'll maintain certain levels that way. Just like, for example, it maintains uterus. So you can actually produce the uterus by estrogens, but you need to maintain a progesterone. That's one of the reasons why most miscarriages are a progesterone deficiency. Okay. But if you look at the estrogens, so when my wife suffered from endometriosis, they measured one estrogen and it was normal. So they couldn't figure out what was going on. And most doctors, including to this day, still don't measure all the estrogens, so they don't have a really good picture of what to do with women because they're trying to make a judgment on a woman's body without having a complete picture of what's going on. So, and in order to even measure estrogens, you need to do two labs at once. Most doctors don't know that, so it's not part of their, uh, their practice. So then with all these estrogen-dominant conditions like breast cancer, and they run estradiol, estrone, which is the two major ones if they ever run two. Estrone's the major one for menopausal, but cyclic, it's usually estradiol, and that's when you look at most, so most women that are cyclic, they'll just measure the one. 
But that's a really horrible way of judging a woman's physical and psychological health when you're trying to measure one when there's a whole bunch of them that need to be measured. Oh, the same thing happens with thyroid. I had yep. thyroid cancer. Mm-hmm. Took it out. You know, they would do TSH. And I said, what about T1, T2, T3, T3, T4, four, yeah. reverse T3, yep. uh, TPA. You know, there's like seven or eight different PG, thyroid things exactly. you can look at. And, and that's the thing. And But because of the fire department thinking, they don't care about it. Now, remember, it's not that they don't care as a as a person individual. It doesn't fall within their practice guidelines. So, therefore, they don't care about measuring all of them because there's no way of them to even treat them because there is no axe and hose, drugs and surgery to affect those things. So, therefore, they only measure what they can treat. And the majority of form of treatment they use for uh, thyroid issues is actually, you know, levothyroxine or synthroid, which are going to try to manipulate T. SH, which isn't even a brain, which is even a thyroid hormone, it's a brain hormone. And if you're lucky, they'll measure T4 and T3, and they usually measure your free values. But once again, they've missed such a big, complete picture of the thyroid and what's really going on. And on top of it, if you've had your thyroid removed, they may have, they may tell you, you have to take synthroid or levothyroxine for the rest of your life. But I will even tell you, because I deal with all professionals, um, medical and natural that way, that there is a safer venue that you can get prescribed for you, like Armour or Nature Throid. So go talk to your doctor for that advice. Because once again, uh, levothyroxine and synthroid, especially synthroid, have never been actually even uh, FDA approved because of the negative side effects. So therefore, once again, that's why they move everybody towards levothyroxine. But on top of it, there is actually even safer forms that you can buy right at the pharmacy. But because the doctors aren't trained in it well, they leave Armour and Nature Throid on the shelves, even though it's at every pharmacy that can be prescribed. And doctors will even say something like, well, we can't control the dosing. Well, yes, you can. You just got to make sure you test them on a regular basis. So that's where, when I looked at all the hormones back way before, I, I was testing complete thyroids before people even knew about it. Once again, now what I mean by that is this. People would come in, and back then, they just measure your TSH. I was sitting there going, I want to measure all your thyroid hormones. And they're like, what? I didn't even know that there's other thyroid. And TSH isn't the thyroid hormone. Just like estrogen isn't a hormone, it's a term that describes many of them. So then on top of it, it's still, but you got to remember, then on top of it, what happens is this. Uh, I caution everybody saying, well, doc, my progesterone's low. They gave me some supplements and it did work. Well, of course it did. You just put a, a replacement, but you still never found out what major progesterone levels go low. So the minute you stop taking that supplement or the body keeps to get worse, the supplement work, won't work in the future either. That's why, that's why we have yeah. more medications and more supplement use ever in history, yet people still have more diseases ever in history because the thinking needs well, to change more than the thing. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, no, it makes sense. How is supposed? How is someone supposed to figure it out? If, you know, Last they've been told testing. they have low testosterone. Sure, but let's and, let's walk through know. this. Yep, low testosterone is very common today. We have we have lower testosterone levels than we ever have in history. But you think of this way: look at testosterone and its production. The production ninety-seven to ninety-eight percent. I've even read ninety-nine percent actually is produced by your testicle. Okay. Then what happens is this: then some of it's converted, you know, in from our liver and other things that way. And so you look at the majority of people do not have a testosterone production problem. What they do is they're converting it to other hormones like estrogens. And what they're doing now, and that's why you see men, one out of every 100 breast cancer diagnoses are men now today because they're starting to convert their testosterone to estrogens. And the number one significant thing that does that is actually sugar consumption and obesity. So instead of actually trying to replace testosterone with men, either bioidentically or even supplement form that way, you got to get men to stop their sugar. You got to get men to lose weight. And just by nature of those two things alone, if men just stopped their sugar right now, the testosterone levels would start to increase. If men fasted, if men got rid of a bunch of the adipose tissue, they would see a normalization because the majority of their production is already there. They're just causing a conversion into different forms, which actually drains it. It's like, it's like opening up the, uh, it's like having opening up a, a tub with seven drains. You're only supposed to have one. And it's actually putting men in a very uh, hypotestosterone based state which isn't good for anybody. I remember also about 11, 12 years ago, I started working out again in earnest, and, man, that ramped up testosterone for a while. I, and, sure and I told the trainer, I said, hey, I can be not tell anyone this. He goes, I don't know, you know, but he said he had seen it many times. So that maybe that's another thing that can be added to the mix to help people. Right. Remember, there are multifactual things, but you got to remember is like, in, but here's what does happen. By working out, you're going to get an anabolic push, but it's like this. If you don't see a drop in sugar consumption, you can develop your whole muscular system. But you ever see these weightlifters, the big ones? They still have big bellies, mm-hmm. Sam, because they don't stop their sugar consumption. And that's why they end up with fatty liver and uh, adipose tissue around their abdomen. They just have bigger muscle, muscles, <laughs> muscles because they're, they're pushing the, the, uh, the regeneration of their, of their soft tissue. Uh, 
And that's why you still see even in most weightlifters some obesity issues because of they, they're just eating high doses of protein, which, for example, your body will convert to sugar very quickly if it's not with the right specific proteins. So what um, – I don't know, just again, before we dive in a little bit more, what yep. any stories come to mind, really memorable stories of patients that you worked with or your clinics have worked with that, yep. that, you know, that you can relate? I can literally tell you about a woman that's texting me right now, um, and I can give her her first name. Her name is Bethany, and I'll give you the next name. I just saw the woman last Friday. Her name is Hillary. So, for example, my whole career I dealt with, obviously, because what happened to my wife, I dealt with a lot of fertility issues. Um, those two ladies I'm telling you right now were the two toughest ever. The one I'm just, that's uh, Bethany who's texting me right now, uh, she suffered massively, massively for endometriosis, had major surgeries to remove all the endometrial tissue multiple times that way. And they kept on telling her that once again, they should rip her ovaries and uterus because otherwise it's going to continue. Well, they don't realize that, for example, as those hormones, obviously estrogens were, certain estrogens were high on her, which was causing a lot of growth and proliferation. Ladies, that's what estrogens do. They develop your breast tissue, develop your uterine line, develop all the tissues, maintain, and then progesterone kind of maintains it, keeps under balance that way. But what happened is this, her estrogen levels were, were so elevated that they don't, once again, medical field doesn't know how to normalize them. They never can. They don't have the tools to do it. So what they did is say, listen, well, we just got to rip it out so we can slow down the production. Otherwise, it's going to turn out with cancer. So once again, found out what was going on with her, started to reverse those processes, started to actually, she was very deficient in certain things in her liver, and the liver converts a lot of those hormones. And as we started to get those to normalize, then, then those estrogen levels went back to normal. But the endometrial tissue started to dissolve. Then we started to actually make that thing change. And, of course, now she has a beautiful baby boy. One, another great patient, Hillary, who uh, came to me about four years ago because she had major hyperthyroidism. Her eyes were bulging out of her head. They told her she can't get pregnant. Uh, she's, they've been trying for uh, almost seven years. Uh, and they said, listen, we need to rip out your thyroid. And people do not realize that hyperthyroidism, the majority of them, if not probably 99% of them, are an autoimmune condition. So therefore, thyroid problems, most thyroid problems, even hypothyroidism, 90% of those are autoimmune. So most people that suffer from a thyroid issue do not suffer from a thyroid issue, they suffer from an immune issue. So it's our job to figure out what is going on with that. So we start digging. She had food allergies, she had some gut infections, which are simply done by testing. And then, no joke, uh, Hillary herself, you know, one of the things that actually caused her thyroid to go bad was actually broccoli, was actually cabbage, was actually dairy, was actually wheat. Because once again, now people say broccoli, broccoli is a very healthy food. Well, that doesn't make sense if you're a clinician because what you're doing is you're correlating to think that everybody's the same and that everybody can eat broccoli and be normal. Um, I, have a, I have an egg allergy. So if I eat an egg, organic or not, perfectly done, perfectly grown, um, I could die. So the concept of nutrition, which is, which is one of the major reasons why I went to school when I was young, because that's one thing I loved, was the fact that going, listen, everybody's diet cannot be the same. That's when people say, Doc, what's your favorite diet? I'm like, the one that's good for your body. Well, how do we know it's good for your body? Well, you need to test things and make sure that you're not allergic to them. you got to make sure that you're not inflammatory to them because one person's carpenter viewpoint of giving them lumber and nails and hammer to build their house can actually be a, something that triggers a fire in somebody else's house. What do you do? It sounds like you know people have to do quite a bit of testing when they work with yep. you. Testing, from what I've seen, is pretty expensive. Some doctors get good discounts. But, um, you know, even if you test and do, like, let's say, 100 markers, it's just one snapshot of time. So well, what do you see when people test multiple times, and, and how is it made affordable that they can do so? Well, it's going to sound funny as a doctor, is affordability is something that is set on a lab, not on us. And um, here's what happens this. Asking a doctor to do a workup with them without labs is just handicapping us. See, I, I, people always come to me, and they'll take, like, 10 supplements. And they'll, they'll say, how do, and I'll ask them one question, how do you know you need them? Well, I need, well, no, you're just based on a guess or you read an article that someone told you that this is something that's good for them, okay? And you got to remember, a snapshot of time is actually really overblown when I hear that statement that way because here's what happens this. Because when you're actually taking an immune test, because that's what food tests are, they're immune tests. And if they're done right and done by the right companies, you're actually seeing how their immune system is responding to the environment. No different than I can run a, a lab right now in your immune system to tell you if you're going to be susceptible to COVID or not. You know, Sam, because once again, if you're deficient in natural killer cells, if you're deficient in CD8 cells that way, you're more susceptible to get COVID and die from it than having a normal level that way. And guess what happens? And those immune cells are not changed day by day. Just like, for example, how your body responds without care to an allergy by, by something that can trigger your immune system and make it respond. For example, you can pull my blood right now and you pull it and I, and I, and I do it every single year. And my, IgE to my egg is still there every single year. 
Um, now, Jerome, there are situations where as your body repairs and regenerates that you may not respond that way and you can actually remove that allergen. I just have not had that happen to me, but I've actually haven't even had that to patients. So what you're doing is you're watching the progress and rebuilding of a person's body to change. See, we, we think our body is such a static thing. That's why when people hear, I hear the arguments about saying it's a snapshot. Well, let me ask you a question. Even in the last year, has your body changed even if you've gotten better? Of course it is. Your body here, your body never stays the same. It never does because what happens? You're either growing or you're dying. There's two separate ways. And if you're on a degenerative path, those labs will continue to get worse. If you're on a regenerative path, they'll get better. So the idea is this. I don't want them to stay the same because there is no such thing as the body staying the same. It's a constantly dynamic changing thing. And here's what happens. So that's why when people say, well, I'm just going to throw some food at it that way and it's going to be good at me. I'm like, be careful because even as you continue to get healthier, you can start to react to things that you never acted to before. Interesting. So as people change their diet, how frequently do they need to have their biomarkers looked at and how, how frequently do you need to make adjustments to what they're eating, what they're supplementing with? I would say what skin? It depends on the level of stress to their body because let's even look at autoimmune conditions in the first place. So let's look at like even shingles. Um, let's take a shingles, for example. That's a really good one, especially even post-COVID shot. A lot of people get shingles post-COVID shot because it's such a stress to your immune system they have now a breakout of, uh, of it, and it's a very detrimental because they put a, such a shock to their system. Well, most shingles before COVID vaccines actually popped up as shingles when there was a huge aspect of mental stress. Whenever you have something major happen in life, it can change your immune response, your hormonal response, your GI response that way. And But majority of the time, the body takes a little bit more time to change. And so if you're not in a high stressful situation, usually about every year, I would get some labs done to make sure to see what your body needs or what it's going through or see if there's anything. Now, if you're suffering from a major condition, you may need labs every three months or every six months that way. It depends on if you're in a recovery state or if you're doing pretty well and just want to just want to see where your body's at and see the things you need to tweak over the course of time. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So what, what would be a... Uh... I know it's different for everybody, but what are what are some of the sets of things that people will experience when they go to one of your clinics? Like what will happen first and next and next and next? Well, if you look at this, so there's certain systems in our body are actually very important to maintain. You know, if you look at look at how the body runs, I would tell people, go back to go back to the analogy of fiber burn carpenter and look at our body like a house. We gotta make sure that people have sufficiency. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't care how well it take care of your house. If you don't have, give it what it needs, it's really important. So foods are extremely important. So I want to make sure that the foods that a person is not giving themselves uh, are not inflammatory because inflammatory things are a bad day. They really are. If you look at if you look at the one thing that doesn't matter what spectrum of doctor you are, you can be a full medical thing, drugs and surgery are the only way to life, and you can be the totally natural person and think that drugs and surgery are bad or all the spectrum of doctors in between their thinking. There's one universal factor that we all agree upon that every disease from heart disease, cancer, to a problem with your big toe, to a bleeding gum, have, a, have, a, have one correlation. It's some inflammatory response, all right? So one of the major keys, I don't care if you're a podiatrist and you have a swollen foot, there's some inflammation. I don't care if you're a dentist and you have gum disease, some inflammation, or degenerative teeth, some inflammation. Chiropractor, some inflammation. Medical doctor, some inflammatory thing. So it's very important for you to investigate those inflammatory things. So when you come to an office, we're going to look at the things that are now inflammatory, but then also figure out what a person's body needs so we can start to rebuild it. You know what I'm saying? And, and I always tell people, you know, if you look at guys, let's just in general, one of the most inflammatory things for just guys in general is sugar now and also processed sugar. So we'll look at guys and say, listen, let's try to cut back, okay? Women... By far, I can tell you one of the most inflammatory things for them is actually mental stress. And it's really easy to show on a lab because their, their hormone levels are, are in a high stressful state. And then we start really getting specific on different things that we're going to look at going, okay, what's inflammatory for your diet? What's inflammatory for your lifestyle that way? Once again, which can be tested for. And there's even inflammatory markers like CRP, ESR, and other ones that really actually give us a snapshot of where these things are coming from people. That's why it's very individualized. And that's why when people say, you know, doc, um, I don't want to get a lab done. I'm like, man, without labs, you are trying to say that you are very similar to other people. And I can show you twins. I can really show you twins that have very different inflammatory markers, very different inflammatory things that cause it, and very different things that they need because people's stressors are dramatically different per person. So are there, is it possible to eat out at restaurants, let's say, and not cook at home and 
be healthy and have balanced hormones, or have you found that to be pretty much impossible? Um, if it's a good restaurant, you know, uh, I travel a lot, and um, is it very difficult of a lifestyle that we do in order to really maintain a good li- uh, stuff? Yeah, it's very difficult. It really is. You, see, that's why I tell people is this. People wonder why we're so sick. I'm like, really? All you have to do is to wonder why we're so sick is walk into a grocery store. 95% of the things in grocery stores and probably 50% of the things in Whole Foods will actually just make you sick. And so, therefore, it's very to live a good lifestyle, we're not even set up for it. We're really not. It's quite interesting that the majority of the things that we have have some stressful chemicals or processes and things like that or too much sugar and stuff that, that actually lead us to actually all these conditions we have today. Heck, look at, that, look at the obesity epidemic, especially in the U.S., you know, that alone is going to cause more kind of, if there's one thing that can massively contribute to conditions of both men and women is actually obesity. Well, once again, the majority of that is controlled. It really is. Now there's some hormonal factors, but even before they even got there, that could have been, that could have been done at a much younger age. Do I, would I, would I, would I go to like an Applebee's or any major branch of chain of food? No, because I can't, I can't justify putting something inflammatory in my body and this is where some of the things I say kind of make people disruptive, but I always tell people, I said, I'm, I'm here to just try to give you good information and you choose. See, I'm a, I'm a choice person. But the only thing, the only thing I kind of giggle about a little bit is this, is people are for freedom of choice until it comes to healthcare. And we saw that a lot with the COVID vaccine, but also this. We also, we also see the debate when it comes to insurance. Well, I can honestly tell you, there's a lot of people that suffer from type 2 diabetes that, once again, uh, type 2 diabetes is all based. It's all based. There's not one type 2 diabetes case that cannot be changed by diet. Okay, type 1 is very different, but type 2. So uh, if your grandma is obese and she's taking diabetic medication and she wants us the Medicare to pay for it, I don't want Medicare to pay for it. She goes, you know why? You know, stop being, um, you know, glutton with your foods and then expecting Medicare to pay for your, ty- for your insulin shots. You know, if you want to be that bad with your diet, and create healthcare problems for yourself. I'm cool with it. I really am. But they expect somebody else to pay for your healthcare because you want to, you know, adapt to your lifestyle that's very destructive. I, I don't agree with that. And that's why I recently got interviewed uh, from a government agency over in England because one tenth of their one tenth of their national budget is type two diabetes, and and, and they have universal yes. healthcare. Yeah, they have universal healthcare. I'm like going. I'm sorry. Tell your community to stop being such sugar addicts. And tell them you're not going to pay for insulin if it's type 2 diabetes. And guess what happened? They'll change their diet really fast and stuff. And so to, to compensate for their stuff, I just can't do it. I, and, I, and, and I tell people, it's like, listen, I'm trying to save you money and trying to save you to do things and try to make you healthy. And some of the advice that we give people is very, very tough. And that's why people create emotional statements. We'll say, Doc, you know, everything's okay in moderation. Your body doesn't know moderation. Your body does not know moderation. Your body knows is it inflammatory stress or is it good for you? That's it. So this concept of emotionally justifying what you want to eat, I tell people, I want to eat something bad. Good, eat it. But then deal with the consequences and stuff like that. I just, that's why if I, I'd rather fast, and I've done that before, I'd rather fast over a meal if I'm traveling and, and I can't find something that's decent and stuff like that. Or I, tra- I do travel with snacks and things like that that are good organic stuff that way that, um, that I know I can take and do during time to hold me over to I can get something that's decent. Is uh, are there any examples of people that are just too far gone for you to help? Or absolutely, you know, if someone's been in bad health for twenty years, you know, is it much much harder to get them fixed versus someone that recently, you know, maybe only two years has been in bad health? Well, I can show you. I can show you people that were that were extremely elderly, very sick, and recovered fully. And I can show you people that have some permanent damage that they're going to need some medication the rest of their life. See, and I have no problem with that. And it's just that here's what happens. No matter who you are, no matter what your age is, I want you to do me a favor and cut your finger right now. Your body's genetically programmed to heal. It wants to heal. That's normal. You are not programmed. Medicine has lied to you. You are not programmed for disease. You're not genetically programmed for disease. Okay. You're genetically programmed for health and normalcy. It's just that they can, if they can tell you that you're genetically programmed for disease, then they, then you have no control over it. You got to depend on their medications and surgery to live your life. No. Now, can there be something where a person is permanently damaged? Yes, we've all had a scar before. There are some things that cannot heal fully. Um, but I will tell you this. I've seen some major diseases that people thought they're going to die, and now they're living healthy, vibrant lives. And I've also seen somebody have fatty liver disease, and half their liver just won't regenerate. Okay, And the liver is the most regenerative organ that we do have. That's per individual. But I tell people is this. Here's what happens. Put your body in the best state and, and, and see what's going to happen. That's what we need to do. And, and the majority of people 
can do wonderful things and fully recover. You might as well. I mean, if you're still alive and if you make positive changes, you'll be better off than you otherwise would be. So then there's yeah. no reason to really to say, oh, I'm too old or it's too far gone for me. I give up. Well, and the reason why, but here's what happens. The reason why people give up is because they're actually set up for failure. Think of it this way. Your grocery stores, the doctors you go to, the insurance, what they pay for. So some people go, well, doc, the tests. Uh-huh. The test they do for you is just going to lead you down the wrong path. See, I want you to think about this. If your wife, I'm, well, let's do this. I mean this very nicely and sincerely, but you ended up, like you said, uh, with thyroid cancer. Okay. I guarantee before you find your diagnosis, you were seeing doctors your whole life. Yeah. Okay? Right. It's okay. just normal. Yeah. yeah. But here's what happens. Why didn't you hold them accountable for where you're at right now? They told oh, you, uh, you go to the doctor to be healthy. You go, see, we don't think that way. Sorry. Right. If you're, you're actually, if you're actually seeing these doctors, they're the experts. They're supposed to keep healthy. You end up with cancer. Why seeing them? Okay. And then well, I, didn't, I didn't think them. about it like that. I just, I just took no personal responsibility for it. But you know. yeah, but see what happens is, but the minute you try to take personal responsibility, they'll tell you the experts and listen to them. Look what happened during COVID. Yeah, you say, I, I know. know. See my thinking, I think like a carpenter. See, that's why I really mind mess with everybody going. If I, if, if your wife saw a doctor and OB and all these hormone experts for 40 years, and all of a sudden got cancer, I'd be like, what the hell was she seeing you for? You led her to it. You understand the thinking yep. and the way they do things lead you to that stuff. Okay. So I know that's a mind and, that's a good mind one. Yeah, I guess like I said, I don't I, I don't blame them, but also I don't take faith in them either. I just feel like they just they just don't know well, and they're not gonna help But The majority you. of people do though. But see that's the thing. Mm, mm, and and mm, they will yeah. literally fight you with you. Here, watch this. And I can tell by you've done your own investigation before. But the majority of the public says well, my doctor said I got to take this COVID vaccine. My doctor said this. Uh-huh. And look at you. You're obese. You're sick. And you're still listening to them. And I'm like going, that's why I, 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 I watch these doctors that have no here. And here's what happens. Because, you know, everybody listening to this, including you, including what you want for your family and stuff of like this, everybody wants to be healthy. Everybody does. Yep. That's what our total goal is. Please tell me what our current healthcare system actually does to help you achieve it. Please tell me what the majority of grocery stores have in it to help you achieve it. Please tell me what the majority of things out there, it's actually totally opposite. They actually set you up for sickness. Hey, you gave the example of Whole Foods. I looked, yep. I looked at many convenience stores, the gas stations, for instance, and it's probably 99% yep. of the stuff in there is garbage. Like the water may be okay and maybe like nuts if they have it or a pickle. Other than that, yeah. there's nothing in there that's good, not one thing. Right, and, and, and I travel. I've, I've driven across Montana now I'm look, I stop at a gas station, fill up. I've literally looked through every product and go, nope, just got to wait. Can't take a snack. No, doc, doc, just have a little bit. Okay, then I'm more inflammatory than I was when I left that gas station now after eating something bad. I don't mm. want inflammation. Do you say, So people say, doc, yep. you're 47 years old, testosterone levels at 847, go 100 miles an hour, da, da, da. Yes, I'm like, yeah, because I just, I'm gonna, I, I, you know, we got to fuel our cars with great fuel. I don't want dirty fuel and I don't want a bad engine. Do you say mm. and and then you can live a great vibrant and the worst part is this if you happen to develop some disease that could possibly kill you remember we have more doctors more nurses more medical uh, more medical things in history more natural things in history yet our thinking hasn't changed and we have more diseases ever in history and because of our see so that's why when i first talk these things it's some of the things i say challenge people make them downright mad but i'm like i got a question for everybody how are we doing Diseases yeah. go up every year. How are we doing? We need to change the thinking first, and then the actions will go there. And just like the local grocery store here, no joke. When I first came into town, nobody had organics. Actually, every year, the stores put more organic stuff in, more organic stuff in here, and to the point where it's like, you want to make change globally? Just say no to the bad things, and businesses will change. You know, I'm in my new facility here. I'm producing a full organic restaurant. It doesn't exist in Green Bay. Okay, because why? If I don't like the culture, change it. Oh, that's excellent. Very good, Patrick. What's the best way for people to start to engage with you in your clinics? Where can they go? It's really simple. Thewellnessway.com. Thewellnessway.com. It's just, remember, it's really simple. I, just, I put a ton of videos and a ton of information out there. This, uh, this will go up on there. Um, we have millions of people that hit it every single month and everything on, on our website. We, do a, we just do a lot of informational videos. I, and, and here's what happens. What, and I don't focus on products. I focus on testing. So you'll see a lot of my videos, or a lot of my stuff is always talking about testing and always talking about things that do because that's still the key to everything. See, and that's why I think I differ so much because I would never want even somebody to take an herb or a thing like that without proper testing because 
You're just guessing without it. And I just don't want to see, I don't want people to waste money. I want people to do things. I'd rather have them get some labs done and actually be more pinpointed what this individual needs instead of actually just throwing a bunch of things at them because people say, well, doc, well, what if you take a simple herb like ashwagandha and you don't need it? Is there anything negative happens? No, you just make very expensive urine. And why would you want to pay for that? So, you know, there's, there's, there's great things like that. So I like to be a little bit more, I like to be more diagnostic on the things that we give people that way. And so I think this is why we've had success for all the years and why my type of care appeals to all forms of doctors in all the fields. Very good. All right, Patrick. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate speaking with you. Yeah, I really had a great time. You guys are great. And I said, I've, I've seen your podcast now and you're doing some wonderful things. So keep on putting great information out there and, and let people make their choices. And, and you've done a great job interviewing your past guests as I listened to them and, and uh, as an honor beyond. Excellent. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.